I'm O.G. Shaw of O.G. Shaw Fitness. This is the five minute beginning ice aerobic exerciser program. If you haven't done so already, pull your ice aerobic exerciser out of the box. Hold the machine right side up so the ropes hang downward. At the bottom of your scale, which you should find on the front of your machine, there's a red indicator telling you how much resistance has been set. To change that resistance level, pull up on the top of your machine and turn the top clockwise. The red indicator winds up the scale, increasing the amount of resistance that you're getting on your machine. Take it up to about two units and then let the top lock down into the notches at the top of your machine. Don't leave the machine propped up like this. Make sure it locks down into one of the notches. To add more resistance, you pull up and continue to dial the red indicator upward. To get less resistance, you pull up, dial in the re reverse dire uh, direction, and the red indicator should be going down. Don't use the indicator as an indication of progress or improvement in your fitness scores. The rope will tend to change the resistance that you get at any setting as the rope wears. Or if you get dirt on your rope, for example, or aftershave lotion uh, gets on your hand, which gets on your rope, it'll affect the resistance that you get at any given setting. So don't use the indication, the uh, scale as your indication of progress. You need to use your fitness test as your indication that you're improving. Simply set the resistance so that you can get through a movement in about 12 seconds for most of the exercises or 30 seconds for the running or walking against the resistance and I'll go through that uh, more uh, in greater detail in a minute. The most common place to attach the isotropic exerciser is with the door and this means that you have a lot of portability associated with the exerciser. You can travel with it. There are very few places you can go where you won't find a door that you can attach the equipment to. There's a strap, we call it a door strap, at the top of your exerciser, and attached to the door strap, there's an anchor. And with that, you can attach it to virtually any door. You attach the machine according to the position that you need for the exercise that you're going to do. For example, for the walk-run exercise, find yourself a door, open the door, take the anchor, put it in the side of the door, about hip level, for the person doing the exercises. Now the straps will go through the side of the door, the anchor's on the other side, the exercise is here. I close the door on the strap and that attaches it. So now the straps won't pull through because of the anchor on the other side keeping it there. The second position is at the top of the door. This allows you to do exercises for the upper body. Uh, lat pull, tricep pull, abdominal exercises, shoulder stretch, all are done at the top of the door. Try to exercise with your machine more towards the hinge side of the door rather than the center of the door because the door is stronger here in this position. And the third position is down low. The anchor again goes in the side of the door, close the door, And this allows me to do exercises for the legs, knees, hamstrings, exercises of that nature. Another way to attach the ice aerobic exerciser is with eye bolts and S hooks. So what we have here is a board that's been uh, nailed or, or attached into the wall at the studs and then screwed eye hooks into the board. Another way to do that is to go directly into the studs with the eye hook and then take an S hook, attach it to the top of the exerciser and then attach the S hook to the eye bolt. Now we'll use the eye bolt system here because it just gives us more space uh, to work for right now. Before starting your exercise program, consider what it is that we're trying to do here. We're trying to give you the most successful pattern of exercise possible. There are three things that you need to try to align your exercise program with, and if you will align your program with these three, thing, three things, it tremendously improves the likelihood of success of your attempt to get fit. First thing is work out first thing in the morning. People who exercise first thing in the morning have a 300% greater chance of getting their workout done than any other time of day because you have more control over your schedule first thing in the morning than any other time of day. Second thing is work out every day. It's easier to work out every day than it is to exercise three days a week. It's easier to develop a habit doing something every day than doing it three days a week. 
you have a stronger habit if it's done every day. And the third thing is, it takes 21 days to build anything into a habit. So if you can go 21 consecutive days doing your workout, first thing in the morning, seven days a week, then after 21 days, you've established a habit. Good habit, bad habit. After 21 days, it's a habit, and you have to break it. And it's difficult to break habits sometimes. So seven days a week, first thing in the morning. But I'm not going to ask you to spend 20 to 30 minutes. I'm going to ask you to spend only five minutes, seven days a week, first thing in the morning. But before starting, are you qualified to start an exercise program? If you have not had a physical within the past year, have exercise restrictions, or are being treated by a physician or physical therapist, I recommend that you see your physician or physical therapist before starting this exercise program. I'm available to consult with your physician to answer any questions regarding this program. A modification that I make in the beginning isotropic exercise program that may differ slightly from, from what's in the manual is, I assume that everybody who starts this program has had heart problem and has had back problems. And in consideration of that, I make two changes. One, no lifting for at least your first 21 days. Nothing that compresses the spinal column is being used in the uh, first 20 days of the beginning program. And the second thing is, eliminate the isometric hold. The purpose of the isometric hold, where you're pulling without movement for the first 10 seconds, is to get the muscle tired faster. Once the muscle gets tired, that's where you've gained benefit from having exercise. The isometric hold gets you that point much quicker. And as you get more fit, well, you're still pulling as hard as you can, so you still get tired uh, very, very quickly. But if you have a history of heart problems, there's a thing we call a valsalva maneuver. We're basically concerned that you might hold your breath and not get enough blood flow returning back to the heart. And so we eliminate the isometric hold, and we go through the movement phase without the isometric hold, but rather than doing three repetitions to get tired, you do six, and you can get tremendous results and reduce the risk of valsalva uh, for people who've had a history of heart problems. So no isometrics for your first 21 days, and no lifting exercises in the first 20 day, 21 days of your exercise program. The second page of your getting started sheet shows the five minute isorobic workout. It has three exercises. Exercise number three is the walk run, exercise number two, the shoulder stretch, and exercise number one is the abdominal pull. The walk run. I tried to answer the most commonly asked questions about each of these exercises here with this information. Uh, the purpose of the exercise, the equipment position, the keys to doing the exercise properly. How much resistance should be set? So for the walk-run exercise, how much resistance should be set on the machine? Well, it says 15 to 50 units, or whatever setting allows you to get to the end of the rope in 30 seconds. Don't ever discount the importance of speed in exercise. The speed at which you do any exercise has a lot to do with the types of results that you get. You move too fast, it affects the result. Too slow, it'll affect the re results. There are two speeds of movement in this program. One is 12 seconds, and the other is 30 seconds. Whenever you're moving in this workout, you're either moving for 30 seconds or 12 seconds, and to make it easy for you, the only exercise that takes 30 seconds is the walk run. So anytime you're moving, if it's not the walk run, it's for how many seconds? 12 seconds. But the walk run should take 30 seconds. So we set the resistance at whatever setting allows us to get to the end of the rope in 30 seconds. It may be five units, 10 units, 50, 100, but that really doesn't matter. What really matters is 30 seconds in order to get to the end of the rope. We take the exerciser from the top and we're going to put it in the waist high hook here with the S hook. And again, we're going to set the resistance. Let's say we're going to set it at 10 units of resistance. And then you'll need your running belt for this exercise. Your running belt has a carabiner clip on one end, spring loaded, and on the other end, it has an a loop at the end of the belt. You may have to dig yours out uh, at the end of your belt if it's uh, in there a bit tight. This belt goes around your waist, actually goes around your hips. Attach the hook to the other end of the belt, and then I attach the rope to the S hook, like so. Crank the resistance at whatever level I need. Now, this is very important. Take the handle and throw the handle out so that the rope is straight. 
if the handle is piled underneath the machine, then when the handle comes off of the floor, the resistance dramatically increases because just the weight of this three ounce handle causes the rope to wind tight around the shaft and you end up doubling or tripling the actual resistance that you're working against. So make sure that you throw the handle out so that the handle is dragging across the floor and it will give you a more even resistance and you'll have less of that problem of feeling like you just ran into a brick wall when that handle comes off the floor. And also it keeps you from stepping on the handle. Now the belt should not be on your waistline, but it should be on your hips. Body straight up, lift the knees, swing the arms. I'm going to try to get to the end of this rope in how long? 30 seconds. So lifting your knees. The first thing you notice is that a person comes down toe first. Now that's good because coming down toe first means that I reduce the jarring. Every time my foot hits the ground coming down flat footed or heel first, the jar is equal to three times my body weight. So if I weigh 150 pounds, that's 450 pounds of force every time my foot hits the ground and your foot would hit the ground between 800 and 2,000 times for every mile you jog. And that's eventually going to create problems. So we ask people to run uphill, but most people don't like running uphill. So here I'm forced to get on my toes as if I were running uphill, reducing, producing less jarring. And that's important for people like me with bad knees. So I lift my knees, swing the arms and try to get to the end of the rope. I'm also working my hamstring muscles and the buttocks on the back side of the thigh. These are the speed muscles for runners. You want to get a faster kick at the end of your endurance race. You want to be a faster sprinter or you just want to tighten up the rear end. This is an excellent exercise for doing all of those things. But lifting the knees, I try to get to the end of the rope in 30 seconds. And once I'm to the end of this rope, I stop. I go back, I hook up to the other end and I do it again. Now normally I would go all the way to the end of the rope, but here I'm just going to reset this rope and hook up again. If I were pulling this all the way through, I would get to the end of the rope, unhook, go back and hook up to the short end. That saves me the time of pulling this rope all the way through. Now the stop is very important. When you stop, it gives the muscles a chance to rest while the heart rate is still in the target zone. We call it interval training. Interval training is being used by every track coach in America. Interval training has a 50% greater work output than running nonstop. There's less weakening of the bones in the leg, less fatigue, and less total time spent. So run in intervals, cycle in intervals, swim in intervals, but use interval training. It's a more time efficient way to build cardiovascular endurance, less stress on your joints. So I do one interval for 30 seconds. I stop, go back, hook up, and do another interval. And this time, I go in the opposite direction. In other words, I go backwards. Did anybody ever tell you you have muscles in both directions? Go backwards as well as forwards. There's a better strike on the foot going backwards and forwards. There's a neurologic advantage for stroke patients. And studies show you'll burn between 38 and 119 percent more energy going backwards than forwards at the same speed because it's neurologically more difficult. 30 second interval to get all the way out. And I go back and I do it again. As I get more fit, I crank the resistance up. And the indication that I need to do that is I get out faster. I get out in less than 30 seconds, and that's an indication that needs to be an adjustment in my resistance. And then as I get more fit, after a couple weeks, maybe I'm not even getting my heart rate into my target zone as a result of, of what I'm doing. And that's a signal that I need to step up the intensity of my exercise program. Body straight up, lifting the knees. One day, I might start a little shuffle which might escalate to a run, which might escalate to a downright jog or a sprint. But I'm still on my toes. And if I need motivating, I put donuts on the table and I got a goal to work for. Joking, just joking. But after the workout, I want to make sure that I really work. I don't want to just use the time spent as my indication of how hard I work. And one of the simplest ways to find out whether or not I really work is to take the pulse. Your exercise pulse needs to be taken within 15 seconds of the time you stop moving or the heart rate is going down. So the simplest way to do that is to count for 6 seconds and multiply by 10. So either on your carotid pulse or on your wrist, count for the pulse for 6 seconds, multiply the beats by 10. And let's say I got 13 beats. I multiply by 10, that's 130 beats per minute. Once you've taken your heart rate, turn to page 73 in your instruction manual to find out whether or not you're really working hard enough to establish a cardiovascular benefit. 
Page 73 shows a target heart rate chart. And on the target heart rate chart, you find your age at the bottom part of the chart, and you have to round it off to the nearest five years. Go up to the bottom part of the gray zone. Your heart rate should be at a minimum of the bottom part of the gray zone. If it's not at that level, the theory is that you're not working hard enough to get the cardiovascular results that you want. And remember, it's the exercise that builds cardiovascular endurance that produce the fat loss, the weight loss, and increased energy that most people expect from an exercise program. But it requires working at a certain intensity. You just got an indication of whether or not your intensity was adequate. So for example, at my age, which is 72, uh, your, my heart rate should be at least 100 beats a minute. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding, all right. Um, but let's say I, I were a 40-year-old, and uh, <laughs> 40, don't laugh. Uh, at age 40, my heart rate should be at a minimum of 128 beats a minute, or let's round it off to, say, 130 beats per minute minimum. So at, our, at age 40, if my heart rate were 130 after doing my aerobic exercise or my running against resistance, then the intensity was adequate. Okay? Now, the maximum attainable dots at the top, your heart rate shouldn't be going above that level. If it is, then you're working too hard. So too low, your bottom part of the gray zone. Too high, should go above those maximum attainable dots. Now, this is not a way to measure cardiovascular fitness. This is the most common theory about how hard we have to work in order to get cardiovascular fitness. But the question is, how do you know that this theory is valid? The only way to know is to measure your cardiovascular fitness, and we have two ways to do that. We have resting heart rate, and we have the step test to indicate cardiovascular ability. So you want to see those scores improving if that theory is adequate. If it's not, then you may want to change something about this test. I've had clients whose fitness scores did not improve until they elevated their heart rate about 10 minute beats a minute higher than the bottom part of the gray zone. And you'll have to do that too. You have to custom design the intensity of your workout in order to get the results that you need. Now the duration of the running exercise is three minutes. You're doing six runs, three forwards, three backwards, 30 seconds each, that's a total of three minutes. Now, this is to get you started. We're concerned about you developing the uh, calf muscles, the leg muscles, the Achilles tendon stretch or flexibility uh, in starting the beginning program, and in addition to building some cardiovascular endurance. So about three minutes is what I find that most people can handle. But if for some reason you find that that's a little much for you, then just back off, cut it in half. Maybe do a minute and a half, uh, three one minute runs, or. Or, or, or four, excuse me, three 30 second runs or four 30 second runs. I mean, whichever you, you can handle. All right, now one more precaution on the walk run exercise. For at least your first 10 days to two weeks, uh, before you start running against the resistance, walk against the resistance, okay? If you don't do this, then there's a tendency for you to get sore in your cast because even if you've been running seven miles a day outside, you haven't been running with this much uh, resistance and you haven't been running uh, in this particular position. You're not running with your toes striking first, you tend to run with your foot coming down flat footed or heel first. And that's a whole different strike of the foot using the isobic exercise that you'll have to get used to. And if you want to avoid the soreness in the calf, walk for your first 10 days to two weeks on the machine and then start to run against the resistance and you can avoid the soreness. And always remember to go forwards then backwards forwards and then the backwards in order to balance things out. Now, the next exercise is the abdominal pull. This the exercise is going to strengthen the abdominal wall. And remember that the indication that we're doing this exercise properly is going to be that our backs get to take a vacation. In other words, the back will loosen up as a result of strength of the abdominal wall. Because if the abdominal muscles are not doing their job, then the lower back muscles have to compensate by tightening up. We want loose lower back muscles and strong abdominal wall. For this exercise, we're going to need to take the machine, put it at the top, the top of the door in your case. We're going to lift the handle up to the bottom of the machine. In order to get it there, if I pull like this, that's a workout. Just the weight of that three ounce handle uh, makes it very difficult to get the handle back up. But if I lift the handle, it just zips back up. So remember that whenever you're trying to reset the handle. Set the machine for whatever resistance is suggested on your getting started sheet for the abdominal pull exercise. For most of you, it will probably be somewhere between 10 and about 15 units is where you'll end up working. But the speed at which you can do the abdominal pull is the indication of whether or not the resistance is adequate. And it should take you how long to finish the abdominal pull? One repetition? 12 seconds. Remember, the only exercise that takes 30 seconds to finish a movement is the walk run, and we just finished that.
So anything else that moves should take 12 seconds. For this exercise, you put your back to the door. Handle behind the neck. Now notice that my palms are down. Don't turn your hands forward. If you do, you'll tend to get a lot of work for your bicep, for your arm muscles, but your stomach won't feel a lot happening. So the palms are down with the thumbs out. Don't get a real tight fist uh, grip around that handle. The tighter you grip, the more your arms will work and the less your stomach will work. So just hook your fingers around the handle, thumbs out, and then let the rope trail between your fingers and that will allow you to control the resistance as you go through a range of motion. Handle behind the neck, body straight up, get a wide stance. This is very important. I want you to see my feet and how wide my feet are. If you, there's a tendency for people to want to slide down or bend their knees as they go down and I don't want that happening. I want you to keep the feet planted and the hips planted the handle behind your neck, body straight up. Don't start out with your shoulders way away from the wall. Start out with your shoulders close to the wall. But the wrist should be below the ears, not up here, below the ears, touching the rope. Now, I plant the hips against the wall. I lean forward so that the rope slides between the fingers. If you don't feel your abdominal muscles working, it's usually because you don't have enough resistance dialed on the machine. But let the rope slide between the fingers so that it takes 12 seconds to get down as far as you can go. Now, if you feel any pain, pain is an indication that you stepped over a boundary, so you want to back off if you feel pain. But you can squeeze the rope and stop the movement at any time by just uh, straightening your knees, put the handle over your head, and lifting yourself back up with your arms. But if you can go farther, knees bent, go down maybe to knee level, and maybe some of you will go even farther than that. But once you're down, you stop, Straighten those tight legs, handle over your head, and lift yourself out. Or another way is to hang on to the rope, swing your body forward, and just walk up underneath the rope in that fashion. And the concern here is he wants you to have you come up with the minimum amount of compression of the spinal column or tightening of the back muscles as you come out of that exercise. And then again, we reset the handle by not pulling down on the rope, but we lift the handle and then pull down on the rope to get that handle back up easier. Now, as you get into the higher resistance levels, and those of you who have great abdominal strength, you'll find that you're gonna have a problem. And you'll spend a lot of time trying to get that rope back and forth. So I wanna show you a shortcut that will help you to get that handle back and forth easier. You grab the handle with one hand. I call it shortening the rope. Pull on the knot at the end of the rope. Pull up on it until the rope is now about arm's length, okay? Once it's arm length, I want you to tie the rope off. And the way you do that, you cross the ropes. You have the short rope here and the rope attached to the machine here. Cross the ropes, pull the loop through about halfway and pull down. That shortens your rope. What does that mean? Well, what it means is now I can do the same exercise without having to worry about the rope or pulling the rope back. I put the handle behind the neck. I bend the knees. My feet are wide. My hips are planted. I lean forward and I pull down. The resistance should be at at least 12 so that I can get it down in at least 12 seconds. And once I'm down, I stop, straighten those legs, handle over the head, lift myself back up, and I'm already in position to do another exercise. So this gives you more of a rhythm back to your workout and you're not fighting with the rope in order to get through. Many of your exercises done at the top of the door can be done with a shortened rope, which will make it faster for you, gives you more of a rhythm, and will help you to quit hassling with the rope. One of the great things about using the shortened rope exercise is that once you're done, in order to restore the rope back to its original length, you simply grab the loose end, pull, and the knot automatically comes out, and you simply pull it down to back to its original length, and there's not a lot of fighting over the knot, even though it held you quite securely. 
Now, the final exercise in, I'm going to show you in your beginning routine is actually the first exercise that, that you, uh, excuse me, the uh, second exercise that you would do in your routine. And I'll go over that when I'm done, the actual order that you do these exercises. It's called the shoulder stretch. We live in a nation where we spend so much time over computers and desks that it's becoming an occupational hazard to have a lot of neck and shoulder tension. Uh, we, we have a problem called thoracic outlet syndrome that's happening in American businesses today that's creating tremendous financial havoc with a lot of companies because of the increased headaches, we're having uh, numbness in the fingertips, and much of that's being traced to t tight and inflexible muscles in the neck and shoulder area. 30 seconds a day of stretching can have tremendous uh, benefits for virtually everyone disciplined enough uh, to do it. The exercise is fairly simple. You take the machine at the top of the door. The resistance on this, by the way, if you look at your getting started information, is zero. Uh, there's no resistance required. It's a static exercise. The movement time on this one also is a little different. Since there's no movement, the amount of time that it takes to do one repetition is 10 seconds. Anytime you're doing static exercise, it's for 10 seconds. So zero resistance, 10 seconds for the movement or for the exercise per repetition. For this exercise, again, the machine is anchored at the top of the door. The handles are made even. Now, in this case, I've shortened the rope because of a lack of space uh, here uh, before I'm hitting the camera. So uh, you may not have to do that. and You probably won't have to do that. But if you do uh, need to shorten the rope so, because you don't have uh, quite the room, then that's fine, too. So I've shortened the rope. I put both hands over the head. Now, notice the, the, the grip that I have of the handle. I'm not gripping here. I'm taking the hand and putting the rope between the thumb and the first finger. And then I grab the handle. So the handles are even. I get my body underneath the handle, leaning forward. Now, if you did nothing but that, that exercise can be beneficial. Now, if you have a history of rotator cuff problems, don't do anything with your arms over your head. And of course, if you have a history of any type of shoulder problems, consult with your physician before doing any of these exercises. But uh, this assumes that you're generally healthy and just want to get fit. Both hands over the head, lean forward, then put one foot forward in order to stabilize yourself. And then just hang there. That's all I'm doing. I'm not even pulling with the arms. I'm just hanging here for 10 seconds. And this backward stretch is a position that many of us haven't been in for years. And it's tremendously beneficial at re reducing some of the tension that we're carrying around in that area. Then after 10 seconds, change the angle. Come down not 180 degrees, but about 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock, so just a bit higher than that. Switch legs, switch feet, so that the opposite foot is a forward leg. And then again, stretch for 10 seconds. Now, if you feel pain in your lower back, you're probably arching your back and you don't want that. You want to keep your body straight up. Don't get your shoulders in front of your hips. Shoulders should be over your hips and you're just hanging. If you have the ability to stretch farther, then do that. If you can't stretch quite that far, then don't go uh, so far forward. And then the final stretch, switching legs again. Feet, hands down, one foot forward and I stretch for 10 seconds in this position. Tremendously effective stretches. I use it to get myself out of shoulder pain for the first time in 15 years after a shoulder injury. So what do we have? Well, we have basically three exercises. We have the walk run, we have the abdominal pull, and we have the shoulder stretch. Now, the order that you would do these exercises is listed in your Getting Started uh, handout. And getting started, the first exercise is your abdominal pull. Don't ever make stretching the first exercise you do. Okay. You need to warm the muscle up and then stretch it. So the shoulder stretch will never be your first exercise. The second exercise you could make your shoulder stretch. And the third exercise would be your abdominal, your uh, walk run exercise. Now the ab abdominal pull is three rep six repetitions, 12 seconds each or 72 seconds. The shoulder stretch is 30 seconds, and the walk run is three minutes. So we have four minutes and 42 seconds of actual exercise time. We have 18 seconds to blow before we use up our five minutes. But let's assume that we'll use up that amount of time just doing nothing more than uh, getting the handle back and forth. But we have a five-minute workout. But my question to you is, 
can you foresee any problem finding five minutes a day to exercise? No? Then the next question then is, can you get anything out of five minutes of exercise? Well, the walk run. Well, you can get the heart rate up to 830 beats a minute. The first uh, two or three times you do that. Well, that's, that's an indication that something's happening, so it's just a question of how long do you have to spend in order to get the result that you want. And the only way you can know that is to measure through the fitness test. And then the abdominal pull. Well, we strengthen the abdominal wall, stretch the lower back muscles, three, uh, six repetitions a day. Yeah, you think that could help? Well, you bet. And then, of course, the shoulder stretch, reducing the neck and shoulder tension. If you did nothing but these three exercises for the rest of your life, most of you could dramatically improve your overall fitness level and reduce the number of aches and pains that you suffer through uh, that are related to a weakened and flexible muscle. And then the final thing is you want to measure your fitness level once a week. There's absolutely no way to stick with your exercise program without weekly fitness testing. Over 90% of you will stick with your workout, I have learned, if you'll do a weekly fitness test. If you wait two weeks between, between tests, 50% will quit working out. If you wait 30 days, 90% of you will quit working out. So weekly fitness testing. And then finally, after 21 days of establishing the habit, you may want to expand your workout by adding uh, three additional exercises also listed on your getting started sheet. There's an upper back pull, we call it a lats pull. Uh, at this time, you also may want to add the isometric hold where you hold without movement for your first 10 seconds and then go through the 12-second movement phase. Uh, you can uh, also, uh, the uh, tricep pull, which is a great exercise for women concerned about the upper arm. And then finally, uh, you have the hamstring exercise, which is a great way to improve your flexibility in your hamstrings, your lower back is a great exercise for people with knee problems. And all these are listed in your getting started sheet with page references uh, uh, in your instruction manual that will help you to get going. But then you also want to remember that we have a toll free number where you can call and get uh, answers to any questions that you have about the exercise program or I'm also available to consult with your physical therapist or physician if you're being treated. Uh, and they uh, recommend that you, you do some of these exercises. And one last thing, uh, after about six months to a year, your nylon cords will become uh, worn out. And you'll know that it's worn out and needs to be changed because it gets to be about twice the thickness that it is uh, with the new rope. And there's a simple way for you to change your rope. Call me up on the toll-free number. I'll send you a rope at no charge. And once you get that new rope, here's how, do you, cha how you change that new rope. In order to change the ropes, take your exerciser, dial it down to zero resistance. You need to take the handle off. At least, I'll well, take the handle off of the unit. Just open up the loop around the handle. Take the snubbers off. That's what we call these little plastic attachments. Then you need to untie the knot in the end of the rope. By the time you're ready to do that, it may be that you'll have to use a pair of pliers in order to pull that off, but this one comes out fairly, fairly easily. So I untie the knot in the end of the rope, take my new rope, take the end of the new rope and the end of the old rope, put the ends together. Now I'm going to attach the ends by using a stapler. Just a regular desktop stapler. Put the ends together. Staple them together. And just to make sure that this, they stay together, I put a second staple in them. Now with the resistance at zero, I simply thread the machine, the rope through the machine, comes out the other side. I take the staples out, reattach the handles, and I'm ready to go. It's the simplest way I know to, uh, to change your rope. It takes about two minutes to do it that way. There is nothing that will change your schedule or your financial picture faster than you losing your health. And there's no lasting health without a certain amount of exercise. The greatest benefit of the isotropic exercise program is that it's capable of establishing a foundational level of fitness that you can do in the smallest amount of time or space of anything that we know of. It's one of the most thoroughly searched principles of exercise this country has ever produced. My vision is to see this exercise program being used 
seven days a week, first thing in the morning, just like brushing your teeth by every household in America today. Once a week, measure your fitness level because you'll never believe what this program is doing for you if you don't measure to see what the consequences are of these simple exercises that you do without fail. If you have problems or questions, call me. We have a national toll-free number, 1-800-878-SHAW, 1-800-878-SHAW, and they'll get you my office, and I'll get back to you, and we can get your problem worked out, get your questions answered. Seven days a week, first day in the morning, or your first 21 days, make sure that you do this exercise program. After 21 days, if you choose to expand your workout, then you can add the additional exercises, or you may choose not to. That's up to you. But seven days a week, first thing in the morning, build exercise into a foundational habit so that you can enjoy the quality of life that you deserve.